In this world, there is real evil. It can lurk in the most innocent of places and attack the most innocent of victims. When the Parker family moves into a new house, they discover the home's grim past and find themselves confronted by an unimaginable horror. They must choose between fighting an entity bent on consuming them or giving into their fear. To win, they must rely on their faith and an exorcist to stop the destruction of their family from the haunting. This is the story of a family that believes they were haunted by an evil entity. Karen Parker's oldest child, Paul, was diagnosed with cancer. He was only 14 years old. Doctors gave Paul six months to live, unless radical treatments put his cancer into remission. Karen was devastated. I didn't think he was going to survive the treatments. As I looked at, at Paul and watched him diminish in size and in strength, I began to realize that I could lose him. And that wasn't an option. The Parker family lived in upstate New York. But Paul's treatments required him to see specialists at a Connecticut hospital 300 miles away. The eight-hour daily round-trip commutes made it impossible for Karen to take care of her family. And the long hours on the road were taking a toll on Paul. I decided we had to make some changes. And I knew the best option was to get him closer to his doctors. I discussed it with my husband and he agreed he could transfer to a company in Connecticut. So I began looking for apartments in the area. very difficult because I had four children. I was having to beg people to rent to me and they still refused. Despite the dim prospects, Karen persevered. She happened on yet another house that was for rent. Help you? 
I, uh, I saw the burnt sign outside and I wanted to take a look around. Yes, go right ahead and look around. Although the interior was being renovated, the work crew allowed Karen to see the house. I was very afraid it was out of our price range, but we had to do something. We didn't really have any options. Karen was struck by the home's grandeur. It had beautiful hardwood floors, paneling beautifully finished. It was a huge home. The kitchen was just big enough to cook for her large family. Do you know how many bedrooms this house has? Uh, there are two upstairs. The more she saw of the house, the more she envisioned her family living there. But there are some downstairs you could use as uh, bedrooms. Thanks. Most importantly, it was only minutes from the hospital where Paul was being treated for cancer. I looked around the house. It had very large rooms. It was perfect. Do you know where the stairs to the basement are? Oh, it's right there. Thanks. She hoped the basement could be converted into additional bedrooms for her oldest sons. I thought that uh, it was going to be nice when they finished it. I thought it would be great for the boys to share downstairs. When Karen contacted the home's property manager, she was surprised to find the rent was within her budget. The house seemed almost too good to be true. Everyone was, was crazy about the idea. Getting Paul close to the hospital and his doctors was the most important overriding thought in the entire family's mind. So they were happy to be moving to Connecticut. Karen and her husband, Ed, moved a few yes. things into their new home. It was Ed's first look at the place. Oh, yeah. Living room. Dining room, kitchen, two bedrooms upstairs, closet right. in here. Kitchen's really bright. Ed liked what he saw. This is nice. What do you think? It's great. Great, you did good. Karen was eager to inspect the basement now that it was clean. There was at least one room in the back she hadn't seen. The room held clues to the home's past. Stop. 
a saw and a blade. tools all the time. I've never seen anything like this. thing. Do you know what this is? No. This is bizarre. Chemicals? Jars? What the? freezer of some type. At that point, I realized that it was a funeral home. And we cannot live in this house. I thought, how can we live in this place? How can I bring my children into this home? What kind of an environment is this going to be if they see this stuff? He had attempted to calm his wife. I don't want the he told her even if it had been a funeral home, no one had died there. The couple now realized why the rent was so inexpensive. They had no choice but to move in. We've used every dime of money that we had saved on Paul's illness and on renting this house and moving down here. We had no place else to go. Karen and Ed agreed. They would hide the home's morbid past from their children. My precious Paul, as sick as he was, should not be exposed to these things. I did not want Paul to think about death at all. Because he was just a child. And I didn't want him to think about his own mortality or even the possibility of his death. <coughs> but as they passed the cemetery next to their new home, Karen realized that was going to be very difficult. left the freezer and other large items that might be useful to the family. Karen hoped Paul would warm to his new surroundings. He was walking from room to room. He, he was moving slow and he was very weak and pale. I had brought him so I could mop the kitchen floor before we brought in all the furniture. But as Karen began to mock, there was a sign all was not well in the house. a sign that could not be ignored. In the bitter cold of a Connecticut winter, the Parker family moved into a house that was minutes away from the hospital treating their son Paul for cancer. Karen Parker and her 
husband Ed later discovered the house had been a funeral home. They were determined to hide their home's past from their children. Then something happened that made that impossible. The mop water was blood red. I mean, it was a deep, thick red. It made my skin crawl. What's wrong with this floor? I started getting nervous that I was ruining the floor. As Paul descended the basement stairs for the first time, he felt an icy chill in the air. Mom, we need to leave this place. What? It's evil. He was scared to death. He told me of a voice that called him by name. And I thought this was an inner voice. I didn't believe he was really hearing someone call his name. And I'm looking at my boy, my sick boy, thinking, he is so close to death that he can sense that this was a funeral home. I didn't know what to think. Give you treatment so that you can get better. We have to be here. In difficult times, the Parker family often turned to the Catholic Church for spiritual guidance. I took Paul to the priest that had married my husband and myself and asked him to do a healing on Paul. Show your mercy. Well, he put his hands on him and he prayed. We ask this through our Lord Jesus, who healed those who believed. Amen. A short time later, Paul's siblings moved into the house, including his sister Connie and his youngest brother Mark. This is big. This is big. Oh, wow. You have to get a tour. There's a lot of room. Bobby was Paul's closest brother, only two years younger than him. The house was, it was huge. It's about big enough to get lost in. 
Somehow, Paul discovered the home's secret past. Within 10 minutes of me coming in the house, my brother told me it was a funeral home. And he took me around and he showed, he gave me the grand tour of the basement area. Yeah. Hey, huh? Yeah. Get up on it. That'd be a ride. All right. My brother actually had me lay down on the gurney in the morgue without telling me what it was. Yeah. It did freak me out real bad, but I, I didn't want to run because my older brother, you know, I had to look tough around my older brother. It was pretty creepy. It scared me pretty bad. Karen relied on her faith to give her strength while she waited for her husband's transfer from New York. Although Ed would be home on weekends, she still had to run this strange new house alone. And as the days went on, things seemed to get even more strange. You turn on the gun, yep, and you say, I'm gonna go over there and talk, and you say, I'll talk with you. Me that there was a woman looking at her in her bedroom. What I noticed the most was she grabbed hold of me and wrapped a hold of me, and as I touched her, she was trembling all over. And I mean trembling. And she wasn't a skittish child, so it was very unusual to feel her trembling. There's something there. Karen's inspection of the room showed nothing out of the ordinary. Connie, there's nothing here. Look, sweetie, look. Can you close yes, it? Yes, there's Mama. Mama, there's something. Mama, Mama. There's nobody there's in there. Yes, yes. Look at this. Mama, this is Mama. This is just your brother's putting things in the room. Come on, go I know that Paul told the other kids that it was a funeral home because that's what brothers and sisters do. They confide in one another. And it really made me angry. I, I thought for sure the boys were playing tricks on her. Stop it. Hey, I just came from your sister who is scared to death because she thinks she saw a ghost. Stop playing tricks on her. She is too young. Mom, I swear, swear, swear I didn't tell her anything but he told me. Both of you, cut it out. Mom. Karen was feeling the stress of running the household alone. Her only peace came at night when the kids were in bed. But in the basement, her sons weren't getting much sleep. You could see something moving around and we thought it was shadows at first. But then we got to watching what was going on in there, and it was more like someone was walking around in there. And that's what my brother Paul told me. There was weird things that happened in the house. Night brought terror to Paul and Bobby Parker in the form of ghostly apparitions. By morning, the boys had moved out of their basement bedroom and were camping out in the living room. What are you two doing in here? Mom, we saw a guy in the basement. 
He was in the lab. And it was really dark and we couldn't see him. This is last night? Yeah. H how did he get in? I, I don't know. I don't know. He was just there walking around the lab. Honest? Yeah, yeah. We both saw him. Well, I'm going to start charging rent if he hangs around. He was there. Well, uh, okay. Honest. There was, there was right. a man in the basement. Karen expected things to improve when her husband Ed arrived to spend the weekend. He'd convinced the boys they had nothing to be afraid of. Uh, um, why don't you go downstairs and get some bread out of the freezer so we can have some toast, okay? Downstairs? Mm -hmm. My family could go through a lot of food in a week, so I had to buy large quantities and freeze it. I thought I was losing my mind. I know I set the table, but the dishes weren't there. Bobby dreaded going into the old morgue alone. I knew there was something definitely going on in the house because you'd see things and you'd hear things. Mom, I just heard a voice down in the basement calling for Paul. Where's the bread? In the freezer. Well, Mom, I don't want to go down there. Go to I just thought the house was haunted. You'd hear a really deep, grindy voice. I didn't think I was going crazy. I didn't think my brother was going crazy. I think I thought it was just something in the house. I thought, Paul's got you scared to death, hasn't he? Karen didn't believe the house could be haunted. She thought its macabre past was fueling the children's imaginations. I didn't believe in ghosts. I believed in the spirit world, but I didn't believe that it could interact with our world. Of course, I didn't hear a voice calling from the freezer. And I kind of teased Bobby about it. He was adamant that there was a voice that called Paul. Karen's husband, Ed, arrived later that morning to spend the weekend. Look, kids, I know about the stories about the house, okay? With the kids Does already gossiping in, about the home's you know, past. Doesn't mean that it's haunted or there's anything scary here, okay? Ed and Karen acknowledged they were living in a former funeral home. Right. But they said it was no reason for the house to be haunted. That's right. It's just a house. It was a house before. It was a funeral parlor. And it's just a house now. That's all. We saw a fly in the basement, though. We did. I saw him, too. We did. You can't argue with two people. Look, it's a new place, a new environment. It takes some time to get used to it. Okay. Are you done eating? My husband was pretty much of the same mind I was that, that there was nothing real in these stories and that we had to find a way to put a stop to them and get the children to stop being afraid of the house. Ed asked Paul to set an example for his brothers and sisters. You're the 
and not fill their heads with ghost stories. Hey, cutie, I got your medication. How you feeling? I did look up to my brother. He was everything I wanted to be, you know. Before he got sick, he played sports and everything. He was easygoing. And then after he got sick, it, it put a lot of stress on my family. Paul's daily cancer treatments slowly drained the family's resources. Paul told me that he'd see things and he'd tell mom and dad and they say that it was his uh, il illness so he wasn't really seeing anything. It was part of uh, a reaction to his medication. His mother thought his mental health was deteriorating. I didn't believe him, so I wasn't frightened. I was scared for him. I was concerned about his health. She chose to ignore subtle signs that something evil was lurking in the house. I noticed these crucifixes were disappearing. Never quite knew where they went. At night, the Parker children reported seeing ghostly apparitions in a house they knew was a funeral home. They were frustrated when their parents didn't believe them. They struggled to contain their fears in the face of new sightings. It looked like they were looking through papers. They were picking objects up, putting objects down, talking amongst each other. And it was, it sounded like four guys whispering, but you could still hear them talking. We didn't say anything. Ed and Karen, the middle of the night disturbances were becoming routine. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Let's check it out. Check no, it please, out. Dad, they're there. Come Trust on, us. Sure, sure they are. <laughs> Stay here. And they described these men as being in dark clothes or something like that. I went from room to room looking for these men. Ed was determined to prove no one could have gotten inside their house. So they checked the doors, they checked the windows and everything was locked up tighter than a drum. There was no way anybody could have gotten the house. It was just a, a dream. There were no tracks in the snow or signs that anyone had been near the house. But he was there. You have to believe us, he was there. No, Dad. Dad, he was there. Let's go to bed now. Let's go. Oh. 
They were here, all of them. Ed was weary of being woken up on a nightly basis. It's been a long night, okay? Long night. Get to bed, both of you, now. It was upsetting that they didn't believe us. Karen? You don't understand. Get to bed, now. Now. The children were tired of not being believed. We'd just sleep with the lights on. When something happened to one of us, we tell everybody because we need someone to hear us, to let us know we weren't crazy. So we talk, we talk amongst ourselves, and that way you don't feel like you're crazy because it's not just happening to you. That's where we got our strength from was each other because our parents didn't believe us. Karen was convinced Paul's medication was the cause of his hallucinations, and that he was influencing the younger children to see things as well. The next office visit I had with his oncologist, I asked him about it. He said that uh, there was no chance of him having hallucinations or delusions with the medication he was on. It's not a psychotropic drug. You have to look somewhere else for that. The doctor's answer was troubling. If it was the medication's fault, Paul's behavior would make sense. But now it seemed Paul might have a psychological problem in addition to his cancer. The possibility of yet another medical crisis was too much for Karen and Ed to bear. At that point, him and I both were working all the hours we possibly could, and the medical bills was staggering. I mean, there was two-inch stack every day in the mail. Ed was stunned by the latest electric bill. He quickly isolated the cause. The children were keeping all of their lights on when they slept at night. Paul's ghost stories caused Ed and Karen to lose sleep. Now they were costing the family money it didn't have. Ed removed all but one of the light bulbs. to bring them relief, now brought them new horror. <laughs> and there was my sister Connie. And she was flipping the light switch on and off and lights were coming on and off, on and off, even though there was no bulbs in it. <laughs> and then she ran up the stairs, and I ran up after her. And my mother said she didn't just come down to your room. She's been in there for two or three hours. And I didn't believe my mother, of course. So I walked back, then I looked. 
she was sound asleep in her bed. What really scared me was because it took a form of someone in my family, and it was really unner un unnerving. quit trying to convince his parents that something diabolical was lurking in the house. He decided to confront the voice that haunted him. chilling cold of a Connecticut winter, cancer victim Paul Parker felt isolated from his own family. His parents refused to believe he was being tormented by evil spirits. disturbing change came over him. Him and I were very close. And he just started gradually pulling away. And he started becoming more reserved and quiet. He insisted on his own bedroom and no longer feared sleeping alone. change in Paul alienated his brother Bobby. He started wearing a lot of dark clothing, didn't talk to me as much. He just went, he just went downhill. Paul, you land. It's normal. You're in remission. As it stands right now. While well, Paul seemed to be suffering from mental problems, his physical condition improved. Well, Mary, I'd just like to see him back in about three months. Okay. He can make the appointment. But Paul seemed to take no joy in the astounding news. With Paul's cancer no longer a crisis, Karen took in her first house guest since moving into their new home, her 17-year-old niece, Teresa. My mother and my father were divorcing. Just didn't work out too well, so uh, my aunt called and invited me to come be with them. We were pretty close. Teresa noticed that someone was missing. You look great, I love you. How was the trip? Good. Good trip. Where's Paul? Um, Come on, you want to help let me take your coat. The luggage upstairs. Okay. okay. You boys pick up those toys in the room, okay? Yes, sir. Paul and Teresa had always been good friends. Karen hoped Teresa's presence would help Paul be a part of the family again. I think so. Anyway, he's in the basement. That's where he pretty much hangs out now, so you should go see him. In 
Paul was a, a good kid. Felt sorry for him when he was sick. You know, just pitied him a lot. Paul. <laughs> Paul was uh, a lot different from what I had remembered. He went from this really sweet kid to being angry. It was almost like he had this meanness coming over him slowly and was not a happy person. While Teresa was surprised by the changes in Paul's appearance and disposition, what he was saying concerned her the most. Paul would tell me about how he had heard things and seen things and uh, Aunt Karen and Uncle Ed did not believe him. He felt alone. He said it, it never got better, it always, it got worse. And it went from, you know, I heard this thing scratching on my door to this thing won't leave me alone. He's at my bed every night and he's talking to me. He would talk bad about his mom and dad. And would talk bad about his little brothers and sisters, and it would tell him to go do bad things to them. The look in his eyes that you would see it didn't seem like it was him. He was just not himself. I know what the problem is in this house. You are. You're so blind. You don't even know what's going on. I in know this what's house. going How can you on. Say that? It was like suddenly hate was a part of the household. You don't even care about this. You don't even know what's going on. How can you? It doesn't say matter. It's my house, and you're going to live by my rules. You understand what I'm saying? They were arguing at this point about Paul's behavior. Everybody's seen it too. You're the only one that doesn't know what's going on. You've got them so scared. They're not going to say anything else. You can't even tell me that you walk away from me. Because he was just getting out of control. This uh, demon got stronger and meaner to him every time it came to him. Paul got to where he couldn't leave the room. He couldn't talk back. This demon would tell him, go upstairs and do something bad. Teresa didn't want to violate Paul's trust. Oh, not so well, no. But she was yeah. deeply concerned He's about him. Sure. What? She told his mother about some of the dark thoughts he was harboring. And the demon that Paul believed was controlling him. There's something wrong with him. There were a lot of things that Paul went through at this time that really frightened me. He was writing things down. There was this one poem. It was very dark. He told me that it came from the man in the suit. Karen worried that Paul's obsession with the macabre was a result of his facing his own mortality at such a young age. Only one person could have exposed Paul's innermost secrets to his mother. Teresa. Paul could see these people walking around her that were dead and buried, and they were all in yes. our basement. He was told that this demon was going to do things to him if he didn't listen and do what he was told. Get off her. 
our relationship started to disintegrate at that time, it wasn't, I didn't trust him anymore. Bobby and uh, Teresa were afraid of him. His temper was flaring and he was unpredictable. I felt uncomfortable in the house and I felt there were bad things in there and I needed something. <laughs> So she gave me rosary beads. I slept with it as a necklace, as, as strength, because when you held these rosary beads, it, they were just such, there was so much comfort in them. The incident prompted Karen to take Paul to a psychiatrist. You'll need him to come back in for some more tests or whatever like that. The doctor was concerned I'm about Paul's problem, behavior we can really and his writings. He suggested further counseling and therapy. Karen agreed. But it was already too late. because of how violent he became. And everybody thought he went crazy because he was, he was off the deep end. And then the ambulance showed up and he started crying and saying, well, why, where am I going? Where are they taking me? And they put him in an ambulance and took him away. Get him off of me. Ed and Karen followed the ambulance to the hospital. Paul issued an ominous warning to his parents. Now that I'm out of the house, they'll be after you. He warned me that things would get worse now. It made me kind of afraid that my son's mind was never going to be normal again. The Parker family was shattered by having to hospitalize their son, Paul. He believed he was being controlled by a demonic entity. Now that he was out of the house, Paul warned his parents that the entity would attack the rest of the family.
was exhausted, emotionally drained, and I wanted to go to sleep. That's all I wanted. I kind of had this little nagging voice. What if this is real? What if this is going on? I wanted to believe that Paul wasn't going crazy. And I sat on the steps waiting for this man, almost hoping to see him. And I felt a fear and an energy that I couldn't explain. And I felt very cold. I couldn't really see anything and I was looking hard as I could to see something. Freezing to death. She dared the evil that Paul said was in the house to show itself. It was a challenge to anything in the house to leave my children alone. But I never saw anything. Ed hoped his work would distract him, but he couldn't stop thinking about Paul. He worried about his wife being home alone in such an emotional state, and what his children and his niece Teresa had seen. He had no idea that there was so much more to worry about. This time, they couldn't deny what they had seen with their own eyes. Are you okay? It was a horrible situation. It was just so frightening. I didn't think I was going to get out. All I kept thinking is this is not happening. This is in my mind, you know, oh my, I'm going crazy. Whatever attacked Karen and Teresa seemed to have followed Ed to work.
I did not know how to handle this and I could not protect this child who needed me to protect her. And this black darkness came over us. Teresa thought she saw a man on the ceiling. It was like a thousand hands you know, all over you. you. You couldn't do anything about it. Aunt Karen was being attacked too. And it, she, you know, it, it, she knew, you know, it was finally the whole house. I couldn't scream, I couldn't talk, and I had my rosary, and it literally lifted up off my head, just levitated up in the air. I can't tell you what came over me at that point. It was as if someone had taken every belief I'd had in my entire life and they were all in a box and it took them and dumped them on the floor and scattered them around. Hello. And you don't even know what's been going on here. Itself through my office. What? Yes, into my office. The Parkers now feared the entity would follow them wherever they went. No. They agreed to call their priest for help. They hoped he would arrive before it was too late. convinced they were under siege by a demonic entity that lived in their house. They called their priest and hoped he would arrive before it was too late. sounded like his brother. But Paul was in the hospital. Paul? <laughs> Paul, where are you? When the priest started to show up, uh, I knew things were actually getting serious. Oh. And then after I spoke with you this morning... Is... Karen expected answers along with a solution for what was happening in the house. We told him the things that had been going on, and he listened very attentively, and at the end of it, he said, I believe you, now, I want you to forget about it, and it will stop. Many of those who accept the possibility of supernatural activity believe that to acknowledge evil is to give it strength, and that the best defense against such evil is to ignore it. I thought that 
He didn't have a clue what we were talking about. How could you forget something like this going on? While you're under attack, how do you say, okay, this isn't happening? How do you do that? If the church wouldn't solve the family's problem, Karen would look for help from less conventional sources. Weeks earlier, she saw an article about a husband and wife team of demonologists. She discounted it at the time, but now she was desperate. Ed and Lorraine Warren have spent decades confronting the supernatural. Several of the cases they've worked on have appeared in books and movies, including the Amityville Horror. My husband, Ed, and myself are called in on cases dealing with all aspects of the paranormal, from a human haunting to an inhuman haunting to um, possessions and exorcisms. This occurs chiefly at night. Yes. Um, who's present when it happens? The boys have seen it. Um, Connie says she saw a presence. Um, everyone in this house has had something happen except for Mark. The family told the Warrens about all the supernatural things they'd experienced in the house. Don't be alarmed. Lorraine moves like this when she's starting to feel the presence of an entity. Lorraine Warren believes she has the gift of discernment, which is an extrasensory ability to detect spirits and supernatural phenomena. She was immediately drawn to the basement. When I got downstairs, it was, it was just horrible. The infestation was very, very bad. And that thing that I'd chosen this house that was no human spirit. It was overwhelmingly sickening. They considered that we had a doorway straight to hell in, the, in our house, and it was in the basement, and you couldn't see it, but you know, physically could feel it. To remove the entity, the Warrens told them, they needed the Catholic Church to officially sanction an exorcism. According to Michael Cuneo, a professor of sociology and anthropology at Fordham University, the type of exorcism the Parker family needed is rarely performed. He's the author of the book, American Exorcism. True believers in exorcism will believe that, uh, t tend to believe that it's individuals who first and foremost are the targets of, uh, of possession. But there's also a widespread belief that, um, uh, that physical properties, physical domains, houses, cottages, offices and even individual rooms in houses can be infested or infected somehow by demonic presences. To help convince the church an officially sanctioned exorcism was needed, the Warrens contacted their chief researcher, John Zephis. For the researcher end of it, it's very important to go in there to be able to get these things documented. Filming things, seeing things happen, Get the voices documented on your audio tape, witnessing these things so they have the evidence at hand to be able to determine whether an exorcism will be necessary. The Warren's research team literally moved into the house to record evidence of supernatural activity. They relied on video, audio, and other sensing equipment to record their evidence. 
It was very important for us to actually move into this home. It was an emergency situation. Everybody in the home was exhausted. Nobody was sleeping. Everybody was petrified to sleep. They needed someone there to explain some of the things that were going on, why these things were happening, and what they could do to relieve some of the things as they were going on. To prevent the entity from isolating any one person and attacking, the Warrens recommended that everyone stay together at all times. Everybody moved out of the rooms, basically, and everybody slept in the living room. And having someone, they were there, so one of, at least one of them was there 24 hours a day. There was always someone in the house with you. This is a classic case of demonic possession. The Parker family asked the Warrens to explain what was happening to them and Paul. It's kind of a reconnaissance where the demons... Uh... Ed described the five stages of demonic possession. The first is called encroachment. And this is where the, the demons perform a reconnaissance, or so to speak, to select some individual to invite them in. The second is infestation. Infestation is when they isolate the target. The third is oppression. The individual will become very violent to others. The fourth is possession, and that's when the individual loses total control of themselves. The fifth step is death. Karen asked why the entity chose Paul over the others in the family. When a family is under attack like this, and the one son who had medical problems, he would be the most vulnerable of all of them because of his medical condition, probably also his emotional state of mind because of the fact that he was diagnosed with a fatal illness. And it is always the most vulnerable member of the family that will come under attack first. With Paul out of the house, the entity now had to choose the next most vulnerable person. they were alone in their battle against an evil entity that lived in their house. They got help from demonologists who were trying to convince the Catholic Church to conduct an exorcism. But time was of the essence. The entity was looking for the most vulnerable target in the house. Karen had suffered immense psychological stress from the ordeal. She felt a crushing sense of guilt for not believing her son. My neck swelled and my face contorted. I was in this hole. There were blacker shapes their emotions were permeated in my skin. They were all the negative human emotions, anger, hatred, jealousy, distrust. And the one that startled me the most was hopelessness. The sadness was overwhelming um, for me. It was, it was such a sad place and such darkness. But Karen had allies in her struggle. 
With these things that we bring in and the things that the family use, your relics, your rosary beads, the holy water and everything, this is our defense to fight against this. These are blessed objects. The holy water is blessed. These things are used to help combat it, to help it to subside till we can get the clergy or the priests in there to be able to help that family. The fervent prayers seem to have at least temporarily freed Karen of the entity. When I got back to my body, they said I'd been gone for eight hours. The knowledge that I gained was that you have true evil in the world, and you have true good, and you have a choice. So you have to make a wise choice. The researchers stayed with the family until they had enough evidence to obtain a church-sanctioned exorcism. They got little rest. Researchers had mattresses that they were laying on and you could see them breathing. They had a pulse and a heartbeat. I don't know why it made mattresses breathe or why it made them vibrate. I guess just to get your attention like a, a spoiled child. John Zaffis had investigated dozens of paranormal incidents. But he had never encountered a demonic possession as strong as the one in the Parker home. Even those experienced felt vulnerable. How do you fight something you can't see? How do you fight something you can't grab? You can't go up to it like most of us would with our families to try and protect them. Can't see it. How do you fight it? The entity seemed to prefer isolating its targets. John Zaffis made the mistake of leaving the safety of the group. When I was jotting down the events from the day, it started getting very cold. And I know when it starts getting cold, a lot of the energy is getting drawn. At that point, I started calling for anybody in the house. I was calling for the children, I was calling for the parents. Nobody was responding to me. Chris. And I knew this one particular incident was focusing some way just for me. What I seen, what I experienced that night, I don't think I'll ever forget. John Zaffis brought suitcases full of sensitive equipment to record evidence of what demonic activity. What I believe was a full form demon. That but all he needed years. were his own two eyes. Very shaken at this point. The terrifying experience was forever seared into his memory. I would not go back onto that case and left the house. Did I get scared? That was the most scared I've ever been. I have never witnessed something since then to that degree and that intense. I'm gonna be taking a few days off. This was too much. Ultimately, only one authority had to be convinced by the Warren's methods. A 
According to Michael Cuneo, it was the most skeptical one of all. The Roman Catholic exorcism ritual is one of the only, perhaps the only, religious ritual in the world where the practitioner is counseled to adopt a posture of incredulity. In other words, the priest exorcist, while undertaking investigation, is supposed to do this from a position of skepticism. Rather than assuming that demons and evil spirits are present, the priest exorcist is supposed to assume that they're not present. The Warrens convinced the Connecticut diocese to investigate. The church sent Father Frank to the Parker home. May I take your coat, Father? What? May I take your coat? Yes, yes. Thank you. His report would determine whether an exorcism would be granted. Oh, it's cold out there. Yes, it is. He began the investigation as he did all of his cases. Thank you. As an extreme skeptic. Father? The priest exorcist is supposed to subject the particular case, any particular case, to intensive and exhaustive psychiatric, psychological investigation, is supposed to rule out the possibility of neurological disorder, psychiatric disturbance, is supposed to rule out paranormal possibilities, is supposed to rule out even the possibility of fraud. And having ruled out all those possibilities is supposed to say, listen, Let's rule them out again. In other words, the last thing that should be assumed is that there is real diabolical possession in this case and that demons truly are active in this particular situation. The priest investigator listened to the family's version of events and toured the home. His reaction was inscrutable. The family couldn't tell if he would be an advocate for or against the exorcism. But exorcism as a ritual is supposed to be very, very, very rarely performed. And only in those, those very rare and special cases where demonization, as it were, seems to have been proven. But nevertheless, in exceedingly rare cases, it might very well take place. There is the possibility of it. So let's make provision for that, and that's where the exorcism ritual comes in. Father Frank presented his findings to a superior. Although the church declined to be interviewed for this program, it did ultimately grant an exorcism for the Parker family. Save us from illness and drive away the forces of evil. Protect us. Father Richard will Father perform Mike, the exorcism. Our sins make us worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. Be very careful with this one. Father Richard's first step was to cleanse the house. In doing so, he provoked the entity. When Father Richard was downstairs in, in the boys' room, I could see a point on the back of the shirt and it got pulled away from his skin. And I could see an expression on his face, but he didn't say anything.
rather than acknowledging the evil and giving it strength. Father Richard tried to ignore its provocations. But the entity refused to be ignored. For the exorcism to be successful, the supernatural presence would have to be confronted with the faith of the priest and those in the room. The entity would not go without a fight. The darkness cast over the Parker home by an evil entity had lasted for months. Now the Catholic Church had at last granted a rare official exorcism to rid the family of a demonic presence. Father Richard was the exorcist. From every evil and grant us peace in our days. He knew the entity was prepared for the fight. We were engulfed in evil all around us and that it was going to take a higher power to get rid of it. The more they prayed, the more they seemed to provoke the demonic presence. Do you reject Satan, father of sin and prince of darkness? However violent the entity became, those in the room struggled as much as possible to ignore it. The power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lord, may the grace of these sacraments help us to weigh the sins of I was off the ground and I was being choked by this huge force. I mean, I literally wasn't touching the ground at all. All I remember is not being able to breathe. Although the terror was very real to those in the room, skeptics would find other ways to explain it. There's a powerful, powerful expectation of healing during an exorcism. There's a powerful expectation that whatever your problems are, they will be taken care of. And so exorcism can be a very effective therapy, at least in the short term. We ask you to bless this water as we use it in faith to forgive our sins. Save us all from illness and drive away the power of evil. Protect us always by the presence of your Holy Spirit. In the end, those who participated in the exorcism credited their faith with purging the entity from the house. It was as if someone opened the windows in the house. The sun came through the windows. It was so wonderful. The house was warm, and it was comfortable, and you were free. You knew, you didn't want him to stop praying, you didn't want it to end, you wanted just to stay in that peace because finally, after nine weeks, you know, of fighting and hitting, being hit and touched, that it was gone, you knew it was gone. What really happened in the Parker house is open to interpretation. Perhaps it ultimately depends on what one is willing to believe we want to believe in one last domain of mystery. Here we have supernatural evil, absolute evil, locked in mortal, fateful conflict with supernatural good. 
that's the best theater you can possibly get. And so I think that there's a strong cultural openness to this because we don't want to live in a thoroughly disenchanted world, a completely secularized world, a world in which all mystery has been bled out. And so I think that this is one reason why the lore of exorcism lives on and why exorcism retains such a romance and such a mystique in our culture because it is one of the last true domains of mystery. To the believers, the exorcism was an unqualified success. The demonic okay. spirit had left the house. Even so, the Parker family chose to move shortly after the ritual was performed. Last of the kids, huh? We moved out because uh, we didn't want to take a chance of somebody else opening a door that we closed. We had too many bad memories of the house. We had too many negative emotions attached to the house. Uh, my son and what had happened to him and all these negative things became attached to the house instead of the entity and we had to leave there. It's a chapter of our life that everybody feels that is done and it's in the past. You might as well bury it and just leave it buried. And I believe this will probably be the last time I talk about it myself. Paul was released from the hospital in the spring. His cancer never returned. The family has moved forward with their lives, but still feel tormented by the horror they endured so many years ago.